Hello, this is Matt Montgomery, sales agronomist with Burris Seed. Welcome to Burris Agronomy U. Today, we're going to venture into a new topic, the topic of maximizing corn yields. We've subtitled this Starter Right, Keeper Right, and Ender Right. At the end of the day, raising corn can really be summed up by those three points. So let's start this session by talking about starting or right. In other words, what can we do on the front end of the season, before the season even begins, to maximize corn yields? As we get ready to talk about this topic, allow me a moment to venture into a little different area. Believe it or not, it is related. You see in these photos Chuck Yeager, a test pilot and the first man to break the sound barrier. He was featured as one of the characters in the 1980s classic, The Right Stuff. Now let me ask you, what's the job of a test pilot? They fly planes around, but why? Well, the job of a test pilot can be summed up as follows. The basic job of a test pilot is to determine the scope of an aircraft's flight envelope. They have to figure out how fast and how high a plane can fly. They literally push it to the limit so that everyday pilots know how much is too much, so that everyday pilots know what constitutes the safe zone for operating that aircraft. Now, let me drag us back to the topic a little that we started out with. A test pilot tries to figure out the scope of the flight envelope, and a grower kind of has a similar job. The grower tries to establish the yield envelope, and they spend the rest of the growing season trying to press toward the outer reaches of that yield envelope. Let's illustrate this concept of a yield envelope by discussing that flight envelope again. This is a flight envelope, the flight envelope of an airplane. It can operate up to the red line, the airplane can, and it will fall apart beyond that red line. It's a generalization, but it works for the purpose of this discussion. Now, flight envelopes come in a variety of shapes and sizes. For instance, this is the SR-71 Blackbird. Those piloting this aircraft literally wore the same suits worn by the first crews of the space shuttle. This beast was used to detect China's first atomic weapon. And this is the envelope, the flight envelope, of the SR-71. You can see that the thing can fly up to 90,000 feet and it can reach speeds in excess of three times the speed of sound. If you push it to the edge of what it was designed for, it can do that. That's really fast and that's incredibly high. Now this is an F-16. This is the aerial backbone of U.S. military efforts. That bird can go only about half as high at the max, and it can get up to maybe two times the speed of sound at the max. The flight envelope for this looks a lot different from that of the SR-71, doesn't it? And here is the Boeing 747. Think of this thing flying in and out of places like O'Hare in Chicago. Think of Air Force One. You have the idea. Once again, you see that it has its own unique flight envelope. Now, flight envelopes are all about potential. What you might be able to do with a plane at the max. Where you find yourself in that plane in a given environment is about the actual. There's a big difference between potential and actual. So for instance, if you take a snapshot of an SR-71 and a 747 at a given moment in time, you may find something like this. You may find that the SR-71 in a given moment at a given time is flying pretty low and somewhat slower than it would if you could really stomp on it. Now at the same time, given that environment, you might find that the lumbering 747 elephant is actually higher and flying faster than the SR-71. It all depends upon the environment, the setting that you find the plane in. There is a big, big difference 
between potential and actual. You could see that. The SR-71 could potentially fly really high and really fast, but you might find that it's actually flying rather low and slow at a given moment in time. Now that said, if you want to go really high and you really want to go fast, you must start with good potential. You'd better have a really big flight envelope. If you want to go to 80,000 feet, the 747 just isn't going to get you there. Let's visualize that. Again, bear with me because we're really driving toward the topic of maximizing corn yields. We just have to set the stage. Let's say this is your flight goal. If so, you had better start with an envelope, a flight envelope, that looks like this. And you had better not start with a flight envelope that looks like this. You can hope to go higher and faster all you want, but this flight envelope isn't going to ever get you there. Now back to raising corn. Like a plane, corn has an envelope that it fits within. For lack of a better term, I call it the yield envelope. Now this is my version of the yield envelope. If all went perfect, we could perhaps get the crop to that red line. This is as high and as fast as we can push that crop if we treat it exactly right, but we can never go beyond that potential. Now we may find that the actual yield rests here, or maybe it rests here, or maybe it rests here during the growing season. How we get the crop started which hybrid we get started, how we treat it during the growing season, what environment we expose it to will determine actual yield, but we can never go beyond its maximum potential. So let's take our flight envelope slide and let's change it just a little. Corn has a yield envelope and it's all about potential. Where you find yourself at harvest is about the actual. The season will determine, the environment will determine exactly where you find yourself at the end of the season. But if you want to go higher, further, with yield, you have to start. You must start with good potential. Your yield envelope had better be big. You had better start or right. Your potential yield your yield envelope had better surpass that yield goal. Your yield envelope had better look like this. And it had better not look like this. Because if you don't treat things right on the front end, if you don't establish and maintain potential, you will never get to your yield goal. So our job during the growing season really can be summed up like this. We want to start with high potential. We want to do those things at the beginning of the season and throughout the season that keep pushing us toward the outer limits of that potential, not things that pull us back. And then we want to end the season as best we can in a way that finds us closer to the outer limits of that same potential. I guess you could say that we want to inflate potential yield when we start to write. So when I think about maximizing potential, I think of a few key things. I think about fertility. I think about hybrid selection. I think about planning conditions that you're putting that seed into. I think about planting date. I think about seeding rate. I think about how uniform your planning is, and I think about mesocotyl health. We'll start with soil fertility. Soil fertility is pretty straightforward. We know we need enough nitrogen. The exact amount can be determined using university web-based tools, but many times we're talking about something on the order of a pound to maybe 1.2 pounds of nitrogen. Again, reference those university-based tools to find out the correct amount. 
Phosphorus levels need to not be dropping below the mid-20s at the least, usually something in the 30 to 40 range is a good goal. And potash levels shouldn't be dropping below 150. You know, 250 to 300 is often a nice goal. But as with phosphorus, the recommendation for that all depends on your location in the Midwest. And in addition to all of this, we have to add P and K back to compensate for that that's removed when harvested grain removes nutrients with that grain. Fertility begins to set the environmental component of yield, but hybrid selection sets the genetic component. We need to carefully think about the hybrid. Corn is not one thing. Some hybrids handle wet feet better than others. Some handle clay soils or droughty soil conditions better. Some will really perform when placed in high yield environments. We all know this, but picking a hybrid is so much more than simply rolling the dice. It's more than randomly picking hybrids out of the book. And again, if you carelessly choose a hybrid, your potential will probably not allow you to reach your yield goal. Now let's talk planting conditions. The environment you choose to plant in can set the stage for yield throughout the rest of the growing season. These pictures show exactly what we're talking about. Seed was planted into pretty wet soil conditions, crusting and compaction resulted, and if these plants got above ground, they struggled to do so. Usually they failed to emerge in this case. We'll talk about this in a bit, but stand, just imagine what would happen with stand uniformity in an example like this. On this slide, we see an immature root system. They're on the left, all growing one direction down the row, the only place in which compaction was relieved. And on the right side, we see the end result of that compaction, mohawked roots. Planting into soil conditions that result in compaction translates into very real yield losses. I've taken a graph related to yield potential, and the S-shaped curve shows the decrease in yield potential as a crop is planted later. And I've overlaid that potential yield loss with the yield losses associated with compaction. The point is this, when soil conditions are less than ideal and you plant into those conditions, your yield losses begin to equal that of late planted corn. Compaction siphons away yield and it provides a convenient example, unfortunately, of how yield potential can be reduced, how we cannot start a right when we ignore planting conditions. Failing to consider planting conditions means that you will take yield potential capable of achieving your yield goal, and you will do this. You'll knock it back. A post-compaction potential that will just not allow you to reach your yield goal. We also briefly reference planning date. Getting planning date right is another factor that influences yield potential. Planning date has more wiggle room associated with it than we might think, but you still have to fit a hybrid in and make sure its planning date works well when you fit it into that period. One reason for this is an attempt on our part to steer the hybrid away from reproduction that syncs up bad with excessive July heat. You want to get it in at the right time so you avoid July heat at the right time. Consider this University of Wisconsin chart, which depicts the impact of heat-related stress on yield. You'll notice that the most significant stress-related losses occur when reproduction and stress intersect with one another. The losses at that time can literally equal a few to several percentage points of loss per day of stress. Think back to 2012. Lots of hybrids began to pollinate, set kernels, etc. At the same time, drought conditions became severe. The result was devastating yield losses. We produced this graph during the 2013 growing season. It basically showed where late planting might nudge pollination 
into tough July growing conditions. It indicated where maturity may need to be backed down to avoid July heat. Planning date influences the rest of the growing season, just like hybrid selection, just like planting conditions, and just like fertility. And frankly, just like population. We are more convinced than ever before at Burris that you have to get seeding rate right. Population must be right if you want to maximize potential yield. As a rule, we have noticed the following trend. If you follow our population recommendations for hybrids, we break our hybrids into three population categories, then you will get very competitive performance out of our hybrids. However, if you push population too far above our recommendations or shoot below our recommendations, you will not get maximum potential. So just remember, when those population recommendations are ignored, it means that you are doing this to yield potential. You are taking exceptional potential yield and you are pulling it back. You are cutting your yield goal off at the knees when you ignore those recommendations. Branching out from there, let's consider uniformity. Uniformity of planning depth and uniformity of spacing. I don't want to get too bogged down in what the term standard deviation means, but let me summarize this slide from Purdue by just saying this. When the distance between plants begins to go all over the place, even when the uniformity of spacing becomes just a little bit variable, the impact can be several bushels at harvest. A lack of uniformity decreases the size of the yield envelope. Planting depth does the same thing. An inch and a half is great, but that had better be uniform. We have all unfortunately seen way too many fields that look like this. You dig up one plant and the depth is pretty good, while you look at the depth on the other plant and it's pretty shallow. Again, this is a pretty complicated graph, but it basically says that if you begin to have even small variations in emergence, like those caused by variable planning depths, the impact can be several percentage points worth of yield. Uniformity at planting is huge. Now I recognize it's hard to get uniformity, but if you ignore it, you will take your potential for yield and you'll do this once again. You'll move it down to this. You will simply not be able to achieve some of those yield goals. Now, we'll close this session by talking about mesocotyl, mesocotyl health. Let's remind you what this thing is. It's basically a thin string of tissue connecting the crown of the plant to the seed. It's the lifeline for the immature plant, and it provides it with much of the converted starch needed to keep that young plant alive. Injure it, and you will suffer the rest of the growing season. And we got a good feel for that back in the late 90s when grape colaspis damaged fields in Illinois. That little critter liked feeding on this part of the plant, and it typically resulted in season-long yield penalties. Disease of the mesocotyl can be substantial as well. This graph is from some seed treatment research we did in southeast Iowa. As you can see, increased mesocotyl disease resulted in more variable plant height which we have already said causes yield losses, and smaller plant heights resulted on average. Only when disease became more severe did plants become more uniform in size, and then they became uniformly small. So nutrients, hybrid selection, planting conditions, planting rate, planting uniformity, mesocotyl health, they all are critical to starting the season off right and not pushing us into disaster at the end of the season. Ignore those things and you just frankly won't start the season right. Thanks for listening to Burris Agronomy U. We look forward to you attending more sessions.